she uh, used Google Translate to uh, localize her app into multiple languages and launch it uh, on Google Play. And at that point, I was like, what? <laughs> uh, that, what I can help you with. You don't have to use Google Translate. I can tell you all the tricks. Min, welcome to the podcast. Yay, thank you Hef, for having me, Andre. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm pretty good, pretty good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Where are you joining us from? I'm actually in Beijing right now. I just finished up a conference. So, but I'm usually based in Shanghai, China. So maybe let's start with that obvious question. How did you get into localization? Yeah, so I had no idea what localization was back in school. I studied literature more like translation or English language in college. So I studied in China in a city called Guangzhou. Um, and after I graduated, I went to uh, Monterey. So I went to Middlebury Institute to pursue my master's degree in translation and localization management. So that was the time when I heard of the term localization. And I was writing my uh, application for the school. So I was like, what is localization in my mind? And I was only like video subtitling and this and that. So I tried to piece up all my previous experience on doing video translation projects. And then luckily they, they accepted me. So I studied learning localization in the school uh, in Monterey. Uh, it was really interesting because it was such a really small industry. So I spent pretty much uh, two years of my master's degree learning about what is localization and how I can work in uh, different uh, aspects of this industry from the vendor side, from the client side, or from the technology supplier side. So yeah, it was re really interesting. I made the right decision to get into this industry. So during the studies, you mentioned that you tried different I don't know, aspects of localization. So did you already know what you want to be focusing on? So I knew that I didn't want to be a translator, just as a like pure translator. Well, I, I know I, and this is a really respected career, but I think for me, I'm usually the person who is like, yay, doing a lot of different things and like to talk to people a lot. And I, <laughs> as you can probably see, yeah. so I, I tried to, uh, so I was more leaning towards project management or account management uh, when I first got into localization. So that's also based on my personal advantages and also my personal interest. So how did that lead you to, to Google? Yeah, I, so after two years studies uh, in Monterey, I actually worked in a couple of different LSPs. I worked in a small uh, LSP in Pacific Group, also in Monterey Peninsula, and also working lo we localized as one well, not like as their project manager slash uh, account manager. And then one day I saw a job post on LinkedIn uh, hiring for a language manager for Google for Simplified Chinese. Okay. I am Chinese. I'm from China, and the location is back in China. I have always wanted to know uh, what's going on uh, in tech industry in China because when I left uh, for my grad school, it was 2015. And at that time, so all the tech, tech industry was just starting up. So I think TikTok or ByteDance was not that huge a deal uh, back then. Uh, but when I was in the US, like 2018, at that time, like already a few, uh, like a few tech start of uh, getting up and some of them already um, like bankrupted and this was really interesting I feel like I missed a lot about like, what's going on in the tech industry in China and I wanted to go back I wanted to experience it firsthand so that's the reason why I also moved back uh, for this job opportunity with Google and yeah after a few rounds of interview I was lucky that I got selected to be one of their localization experts in the team Besides this, I don't know, let's say career reasons, did you want to go back home or did you like being in the United States? Yeah, I really enjoyed my life uh, in California, especially, even though it's really expensive uh, in the Bay Area. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was, everything was really nice. People were nice and uh, it's pretty diverse. And also uh, a lot of state parks I really like, loved I think there's always a charm about the U.S. Like no matter in your uh, in New York City or California Bay Area, 
So I always wanted to go back, um, like to for now, like for to to the U.S. But at the same time, for personal reasons, I I actually feel like、um, I'm pretty curious about what's going on. I don't want to settle in a place for a long time, at least for now. So that's the reason why, like, I don't have to apply for a visa to go back home. Let's just do it. I can just go back home tomorrow to to work there. So just、uh, for my own curiosity. So what do you call actually home? Is it United States or China? No, no. I I would say home is still China. I am still a Chinese citizen, and I feel like,、um, but I call a lot of different places like temporary home, or I feel really attached to like Guangzhou, where I went to school, or Monterey, or Bay Area, or even London, where I st-、uh, studied for a short period of time.、Um, so that also I think enabled. Me to be a localizer because you have to、uh, to get into local culture and to understand and to have an open mind to to make sure like you、uh, you feel local when you are there,、uh, not like you are a foreigner when you are there or tra- only a traveler when you are there. So yeah. So when I was when I was nineteen or twenty, when I was working in my first job with Moravia, you know, in Czech Republic. I think that's when I saw these fancy videos about Google and their culture. You know how people work on the fitness balls; they have free food and so on. And it was always my dream to work for a company like Google. So, when you were looking for these jobs, did you have the same expectations of Google, or did you really, I don't know, think in your head that okay, I'm going to be working for Google? You know, because Google is Google. You know, it's not. Let's say we localize. It's it's Google. <laughs> so did you did you always wanted to I don't know work for this tech giant with let's say a very specific and distinct culture, and then did your expectations meet? Where were your expectations met once you started working for Google? I think I actually it was a long time ago, so almost three years ago when I first applied. <laughs> it's not that long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> It's like lots of lives going on, but anyway, I think,、uh, yeah, definitely, I wanted to join Google long time ago because all the like perks, all the benefit, on all the culture things I saw previously, and、uh, I think for now, being with Google for three years, almost three years, I think、um, a company or the team, the people I work with, actually made me a better person. Uh, professionally and also personally, so it's a it's a really、uh, big statement. But oh, I truly believe it.、Um, Help me develop more、um, like professional skills, of course,、uh, more learning more about localization. But also, I think the connection between people and then、um, our also I joined the team is pretty diverse team made me realize a lot of things. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity and also grateful for the awesome people I work with. So、what is one of the things that you realize about yourself? About myself, I think it's just、uh, also one thing is about、um, my ambition or what I want to do.、Uh, what I、um, so I first joined Google as a language manager for Singapore Chinese,、uh, and then、uh, after two years, I、uh, so I moved to a different role, my current role, which is a localization consultant for our clients. So the switch was a little bit different because first we were working with internal teams on your own product localization, and then the next one is when you talk to you talk to the clients and then talk to they can be、um, like gaming developers, they can be big and small companies, and I think. It's still about localization, but it's really different. I wanted to learn. I wanted to go out of my comfort zone and then to try new things and to be an expert in different fields. Want to try sales?、Uh, I never done sales in the past. I want to do sales, but right now sales is not just about like buy our products or do things. You have to help the other person to go grow with your customers as well. So I think that really enables me to to learn more about another side, the sales part of the business. Yeah. So let's start talking about your role. First of all, I thought it was a growth consultant. It is. Do you use these terms interchangeably? So, localization consultant and growth consultant is pretty much the same for you. I so the official title of my role is international growth localization consultant.、Uh, so it's a pretty a small scope. So that's why I usually start in as a growth expert or localization consultant for companies. Yeah. 
Okay. So you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned the sales aspect. So do you actually have to sell as part of your job? Or does someone else do the selling and then they hand over the clients to you because you're the localization expert? Yeah, I would say everything's uh, like business-wide. So I use the sales term uh, as a way to define the business side. Um, so like, I think my job mainly is to help the clients understand how they can improve their localization. So I wouldn't say my role is um, purely just to sell things. That's a definition I give for sales is to help people grow and help our clients grow. Yeah, when you talk about helping them with localization, does it mean that your customers, they already know what localization is? I, I think they have a few ideas about what localization is. And also localization means different things to different people. Uh, I think specifically in the industry, we may talk about like TMS tool, TEP, machine translation, that. Um, but I think for um, clients or for people who are not in the industry, they think about localization. They think about everything. They think about like pricing, they think about customer experience and think about user like UI design, everything. I think that's also uh, like misunderstanding in the industry that what is look like they should because this term was used so interchangeably um, yeah, in different areas. So does it mean that you help with everything, like even with the pricing or that's up to them and you really care about the, I don't know, let's say figuring out the best localization process that will work for them? Yeah, I would say that there are so many uh, open resources on the internet um, that are available for everyone. So we have this great team, a website called Market Finder, and has a lot of different aspects about uh, how when you actually decided to go to a different market, what kind of things you consider. For example, localization, customer experience, uh, logistic, and payments. So, and also the other things like HR, legal, and other things. Um, so we actually provide pretty professional helps, and not only on the language, but also on logistic and payments. Uh, so there are different consultants in our team um, that's doing this job. So what else does your role include? You, you mentioned before that you like to talk what is the ratio of talking and i don't know doing and or writing emails yeah we all write emails i think <laughs> this is really important core part of our jobs uh and i think talking um definitely yeah a lot of meetings meeting with internal folks and also meeting with clients but at the same time is um think about how more strategically what kind of solution we have and kind of solutions we want to bring more uh, because the industry is also changing, a lot of things happening that we have to adjust our services to adjust ourselves um, to better meet our like needs of our clients. At the same time, we also have to upskill ourselves because even though I've been in the industry for a long time, I'm, pretty, I'm an expert in localization, but I still want to keep up with new trends, new technologies, and also uh, with a with a competitor or industry, just to learn more about uh, about everything. So I also need some time for me to uh, to learn and also to get understand the industry more. Yeah. Where exactly do you find, I don't know, inspiration or new source of knowledge about localization? You personally. Hmm. Localization. I think there are so many sources of things I, I like to listen to people's talks like i like podcasts or i like uh video talks so i think that's also a way for me to learn something really fast um so i also attend uh like virtual conferences like lockboard i also presented there uh last time so i think i get a lot of information from uh from those online conferences and also from those videos assets at the same time, also read. Um, I read the white papers. Some companies doing really good jobs about publishing what they have done. Uh, for example, I think Netflix has a really good blog about on their own internal system. So I learn a lot about their uh, like pseudo localization and their own like uh, translation technologies uh, in house. So yeah, that's how I uh, keep up with the industry trends. It is my understanding that you are mostly focusing on gaming. 
is that correct for helping gaming companies or yeah gaming is one part yeah are there other growth consultants in google that maybe specialize in something different i think the reason why i'm pretty uh focused on gaming is because we have such a booming uh gaming uh industry in apac but also i also focus on other industries for for example like e-commerce or uh, app saas and this kind of uh industries but yeah i think the reason why gaming is such a big deal is because we, uh, i'm based in china i'm based in apac and also One note about gaming is I talk more about mobile games, so not so much about console or PC games. Uh, everything pretty much happens on your phone. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what what actually happens with the clients? They come to you. They say they have a game. Do they even come to you maybe in the pre-production stage where they don't even have a game and they're thinking like, how should we design this game so that it, I don't know, is popular somewhere else around the world, or do they already? usually come to you when the game is ready and let's say the game is popular within APAC then they want to expect yeah i think all this um i wouldn't say there's a specific type uh or they will come to us at certain time uh and also i think that's the charm of it because you are always there you're not like i'm not a machine i don't produce the same material to the same clients all the time so i it's also a good opportunity for a consultant especially for a good consultant to understand what is current stage the client is seeing no matter your pre launch or after launch uh i think the problem is more important than the stage they are in um and then help them paint the picture for their future because i also want to help them grow by themselves so when they learn all the best practices they can understand okay what is the next step for them to do so they don't have to come like just i don't work with them all the time on the like trivial things or like incremental changes so when you advise them on the strategical aspects of let's say going international does it mean that you let's say provide the um, the advice and then you maybe check on them i don't know in a month or two months or do you or somebody from your team more actively help them get the localization right so if they have question i definitely will follow up with the clients so it's not like a one time engagement uh one time engagement is more like a conference or it's a one way communication um what what i usually do is i want to be there for my clients so if they have any questions or if we talked about one thing that might uh like take a long time to implement then we were checking at a certain time so yeah i'm usually i will do body point engagements with my clients because they are my clients and i want them to be successful and i want to help them as much as i can right but it's not like you have to execute on their behalf right that's what you leave up to them I think that's why we are consultant rather than a service provider. Um yeah. Right, makes sense. So how how closely do you have to learn their product or how much do they share with you so that you can actually give them a good advice? Like do you actually learn something about the games or is it more about where the business is right now? How is their I don't know user base in their current markets and what their goals and ambitions are? I think yeah I think one thing um a good consultant should do is to learn about the industry that's for sure uh exploring um their the company's product and understand um more from maybe external perspective um uh, what this company is like or what the company does uh, from uh, all the sources available and then I think the client also has a better understanding about themselves so we can also talk about like ask them to share with uh, with us what probably like what you're focusing right now and why it is i think um as a consultant because i'm also new to consulting like i never worked in mbbs or other consulting firms in the past um and i feel like consulting is one way for me to grow myself as well is to like consulting is actually happens anywhere like when you're a localization manager in your company you have to evangelize about localization that's also an area when people will consult you on localization 
So uh, I think the job that I'm doing now also getting getting uh, exper- experience or uh, skills to myself on how to understand the other person's perspective or the company's perspective really clearly and understand how you can help them and also communicate yourself well uh, to set the right expectation and also align on the key milestones. And so that's how I usually engage with a client. And I think I'm still, uh, there's still a long way for me to go to learn. Uh, but I think that's a good starting point. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask next. Like, do you think only people who have some, let's say, extensive experience in localization can advise to other people? Or how do you remember when you first transitioned into this new role? Like, where you pick because you already had some, let's say, track record? In localization, or did you did you have to be trained a lot to be able to do this role as a consultant? Yeah, I can tell, share with you firstly um, why I decided to switch to this role. So there's a story behind. Um, <laughs> Please. <laughs> I am a big fan of a podcast. Uh, as I mentioned before, I have a few that I can also recommend um, here. So one of them is about um, tech companies, uh, tech industries in China. And this one was uh, was made by uh, a VC firm called GGV Capital. And then they have this podcast was previously called 996 because uh, in Chinese tech companies usually works from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and six days a week. So that was previously called 996. <laughs> it's so sad, but they changed. They rebranded their uh, their podcast name to Next Billion. Um, it's called Next Billion by GGVC, uh, GGVC. So it was really good. And one of the episodes, the Hans Tong was one of the, the, the partners, uh, LPs in the, in the firm, I think. He interviewed uh, this lady called Renee Wong, and she is the CEO of CastBox, which is a podcast tool, uh, really popular in the U.S. And she was talking about, she was a ex-Googler. She used to work as a account manager in Google Beijing. So that's why I feel really personally uh, close to her and uh, she mentioned about how when she first started uh, her startup business, she uh, used Google Translate to uh, localize her app into multiple languages and launch it uh, on Google Play. And at that point, I was like, "What? <laughs> uh, that, what? I can help you with. You don't have to use Google Translate. I can tell you all the tricks and do things really efficiently um so that's why i realized that my skill or my expertise can actually help a lot of emerging or smaller companies uh or uh, some like app developers or game developers to help them understand more about doing local addition because that's the essential step for them to go to global markets and that's the reason why i decided to move to a more external front uh, facing role to advise um the clients that I work with um, on their local addition strategy so that's <laughs> that's the first part about this question <laughs> yeah i think the second second question was for me how do you remember your first days of transitioning to the role? Like, did you have to learn a lot of the things, you know, like client facing? I don't know how much you did of that before. Um, yeah, I also remember your last question. I didn't remember it. I think if you want to be a local edition consultant, definitely you have to be an expert in this field. Um but being a consultant is not difficult in my mind. Um, as long as you listen <laughs> to the customers and you understand, you think. Uh, I think the solution is one part of it. Um, but the most important thing is, is to the process when you work with the client. Uh, especially like on the previous engagement, set the right expectation and work on the project. So it's a commitment. Like both parties needs to commit uh, to this and to invest similar times. And it also mm, makes the project even better if the client is equally committed and also update you with the progress and actually execute the plan that you uh, like you give, give to them. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a it's a learning process. Um, and I think I also encourage people um to to try this 
this job or try more external facing or maybe just start your own com- uh, company to, to work with a few clients. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Did you get any general training from Google? Maybe let's say on consulting, like how to consult in general? There are so many training resources available internally and also externally and also have so many like mastermind I can learn from. So I think definitely a lot of training and also before you search a different role, of course, you have to uh, to learn a lot about this new role, onboarding and a lot of other things. Yeah. When we talk about the solutions, are you sort of like a one woman team that you're like the only point of the contact and of the consulting and advice giving or do you work with other people who may be let's say maybe more technical and they could advise on the technical details to help your clients or is it all up to you yeah i think i'm never one person and uh i think for for this complex topic like localization is also impossible for one person to have the solution for everything so what i usually like to share all the time is the in like open source or uh, like open resources that people can use, including like material design, which I think is an awesome uh, resource platform of everything, like designing, uh, UX writing, and also has a has a one one chapter about designing for right to left languages, uh, really relevant to localization. So. Yeah, I leverage the open uh, resource from there, and I learn also learn myself and also share with my clients. So I'm not the person writing material design, of course, uh, but that's what where I can leverage other people's help or other, uh, yeah, and also the industry available resources. Yeah, but but does it mean that you're more so like a collector of all this knowledge and information, and then you just pass it on and distill it for the customers? Or do you actually work with, I don't know, Jackie or John, you know, like I need your advice on which empty engine we should pick for this customer? I think it depends. Of course, if I I need somebody's help, of course, I can ask for them um, to to provide me their expertise. Definitely. Um, But I think overall is uh, when there's anything available online that I can just grab and collect it for, for, for my own purpose, then I will do it. And if I need help from anybody uh, specifically, I also ask for them for help. Let's zoom in a little bit on the, on the APAC situation, since I think you are very familiar with that. And maybe that's something that I'm totally not familiar with that because normally what I'm fa- familiar with is it works the other way. You know, it's the US, the English speaking companies, they want to go to Asia and not vice versa. So maybe my first question would be, what is actually the source language for the projects? Do they create it in Chinese or in their own local language? And then they want to localize into, let's say, English or other languages, or do they start with English? I think there's always a misconception um, that the word only has uh, APAC and the rest of the word. Uh, or I would say like APAC is also already a pretty big uh, concept that very diverse on different countries and different uh, local nuances. Um, and then the other part, maybe let's say the Western part uh, that's more US uh, dominating the people, um, of course, start their source language in English and then they localize to different languages. But I can also imagine in some other countries, let's say maybe in some Europe, European countries, they maybe start with their source language in uh, in their own native language and they use English as their pivot languages. So I think it probably is pretty normal for any non-English speaking or non-English official language speaking countries to have a mixed uh, solutions. But I think that's getting more and more normal since we, the industry is getting uh, decentralized in uh, different areas. So, so yeah, we will see more trends coming. Yeah. I think it's also one specific example is maybe um, 
for for Japan's pretty industry uh, open. I see it in also some other LSP service providers um, pricing list is they also provide service and they also have it on their pricing list uh, from example, Japanese to other languages because they may be like gaming uh, provide like service providers. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty standard. I would actually expect that you would say that it's the source language is actually Chinese because the market is so huge. And like, for example, or another example would be when you mentioned Japan, you know, like a lot of the games for Japanese market, I don't think a lot of them would be, let's say, mainstream popular in the United States. Like they are very quirky and <laughs> very weird for maybe the Western market. <laughs> so I'm thinking like, yeah, like would they be mostly developed in, I don't know, Chinese or Japanese? And then, I don't know, maybe maybe you use the local markets as a test market to see how the people react to it. Or do the companies really come to you with the mindset that, okay, we want to have this game internationally successful yeah it's a good question i think what i'm um, pretty surprised about um, i'm pretty surprised about how some companies in apac they're so seasoned uh, in localization so they're not the beginners that we would expect like they develop everything in housing uh, from their own point of view and they try to localize and that's pretty very difficult some companies they already had this mindset because they this is what they do. They do uh, international expansion all the time. So it's in their um, like it's in, in their team spirit or in their company's mind uh, like the map to expansion to to expand. And then I think that point is less is less difficult to adjust your like already a published game to another market because it's also not so efficient. If you develop everything, um, for example, let's say a Japanese game developer and you just do everything uh, for your Japanese market and you want to expand to the US, maybe you have to change a lot. So, but I think um, mo- I think a lot of companies, um, they already had this mindset. So when they are in the planning stage, they already consider which market they want to go into. Is that maybe the part where you would also assist them? Like, do you help some of the companies pick the target markets? I think this is really, uh, I don't usually pick, help them pick the markets because really complex uh, decision process. Um, and you have to consider all different kinds of uh like, for example, what kind of game you are, what, what kind of app you are, and also the potential of that market, the local um, like competition, etc. So it's usually, I think, when I work with them, they already had a pretty clear uh, idea about where they want to go next or where they already probably like launched their product. What, what do you think is sort of different for the Asian companies like how they think about going international versus maybe the American companies. Since you had experience with both sides, maybe you're closer to the customers now with, with Google as a consultant, but do you see anything, any, any major differences, like how they think about the international expansion and growth? I think, um, I wouldn't say that's the biggest difference, but I would see, say that it's really uh, unique in eight pack companies where I, which is also one thing that I really admire. Uh, I really love working with eight pack companies. They are really agile. Uh, let's say like they move really fast. Uh, let's not talk about nine and six. I think uh, maybe that's only <laughs> uh, only happening in some companies in China. Uh, but I think um, it's also really important to move things fast and to to iterate and to try and then to fix things. Um, I also don't have the data to compare how, how fast they are with the American companies, but I think that's also a big trend also, uh, maybe also like shared by other people when they work with APEC uh, companies, they move really fast and they're willing to try if they see the benefits of it. So I think that's also really important in, uh, in the current climate um, competition. Yeah. Just the competition and everything. Do you think it's mostly because it's a gaming company or do you see this as a general thing? Maybe 
in APAC because I don't know, the companies are more used to being, I don't know, fast or I don't know. Yeah, this is, uh, I think this is uh, difficult. It's difficult to answer because also one in my mind, I was going through all the different companies I work with, but I would say that it does not, in my point of view, like <laughs> in my point of view, it's uh, not only limited to gaming companies, uh, but also to different or different kinds of industries. So do you think that people are more okay to fail? You know, because when we talk about like iterating and doing things fast, doing things fast, you know, usually, usually the the teachings from the Silicon Valley, the opposite side of the world, is that you need to fail fast because that's how you learn. So, do you think that the people are more, I don't know, open to to failing and learning and then moving on? Yeah, this is an interesting question because in my mind, I think the uh, experience from the companies in Silicon Valley, uh, they already pass on their knowledge to different parts of the world. Like we all know what's uh, probably the mantra or uh, the lessons from the big tech companies. But at the same time, uh, because when you ask this question, I was also thinking back about one podcast I was listening. So that's another plug for a different podcast. <laughs> uh, so I talked about the next billion by GGV. Another one is called, I think it's called China Bus. It's made by China Bus. It's, um, so it has Panda, something it's called. Um, it's made by these two reporters and talks about uh, Chinese tech companies and it's in English. Um, so people can check it out. So in, during one of their episodes, uh, they interviewed uh, a person who used to work for Facebook, for Uber in China, and also Miss Fresh and Mobike. So a few Chinese tech companies as well. And I think he is currently doing his own business and also like a startup, uh, a VC kind of business. And the, the interview was asking it, sort of the same questions about how, for example, APEC companies or Chinese companies, they think about failure or how they think about um, if they fail, what they should do. And the um, the person, he was basically saying that um, the failure uh, in or how Chinese companies perceive failure is uh, you, you, either can achieve really good success for a startup or you have to go home, like go big or go home. So this maybe is really different from the culture in the U.S. because U.S. or Silicon Valley is more, uh, you feel safe even if you fail, even if your startup cannot um, like get to IPO or get acquired by a big company. Um, but I think the because competition is so fierce in APAC and people like the founders can barely get anything out of it if they fail in the end. So that's his point of view from a VC's uh, perspective, from more like startup perspective. But I think I really, I can see um, sometimes how how this is different uh, in APAC and also in China. And he also mentioned another thing is, um, so for employees for a startup, uh, when they want to to uh, recruit new people and they when they're, um, planning for the package for their new employee, new joiners, they tend to, to um, put more percentage on the, the equity or the, the like stock options. But in China or in APAC, people with employees still prefer cash. So that's also perception about how much the individual employees wants to invest in a company or in a startup, because like your equity only worth more if you go like IPO'd and this company goes successful. Um, so that's also a really interesting way from a package <laughs> percent employee package pers perspective to think about how uh, like ordinary people, the workers, they want to uh, they think about this topic. Yeah. It's not related to localization at all, but I think it's... <laughs> we, we've heard a lot about localization already, so that, that's okay. I wanted to ask you personally, like, how are you... First of all, how, are you, how do you think you're agile? How do you think you're fast in, in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, do you think being fast and agile is important for a consultant? Or is it more about being thorough and really looking at every possible option and letting the client have the final say and decision. 
I think as a consultant, when I think about fast and agile, is I have to move fast and keep up with the industry trends,、uh, with the new technologies,、uh, with machine translation. I, for example, that's one of the technologies、uh, that we should all keep up with. Um, and I think overall,、um, the client should always be the final decision maker,、uh, and also we want them to make the final decisions and also develop their own plan. And that's usually what I consider uses you more efficient,、uh, more effective when I work with a client because we have to get their commitment or sometimes verbal commitment or sometimes just、um, like their understanding that this their responsibility to carry out execute the work、uh, the plan. Um, I think we all have to be open-minded and also be agile in a way that we can、uh, keep growing in our current role.、Uh, but at the same time, we have to dig through things really deeply as a consultant because we're the expert. We cannot just scratch the surface of things. We have to understand、uh, what is in and out, and also, for example, how can this service help a certain type of client? So we have to think really deeply. About one top topic. Maybe let me ask this final question about your role. What, what what do you think are the challenges of being a growth consultant? You already mentioned some some things about it, but what do you think is the the biggest challenge maybe for you right now? And what would be the challenge for people who want to become a consultant? I'm pretty optimistic when I think of when I was thinking about my challenges. I know, of course, I have so many challenges, but I don't see any of them、uh, as a roadblocker.、Uh, so I, I think there are some opportunities, if I can say,、uh, that I can be even better、uh, at my job and also help with our clients is to understand more about their business、uh, to keep. With their in the, their industry, and say gaming is one part of it. Within gaming, there are so many different genres of games: RPG games, casual games.、Um, that I have to learn、uh, about their own business model or the business, the industry they're in.、Um, and then I have also to learn more about the local nuances. Um, to help them even better. That's for gaming, and I have different types of customers like farmers. Yeah. When you mean local nuances, do you mean local within where they are headquartered, or you mean local within the markets that they're going into? Ah,、oh, markets, markets.、Um, I, I also think、um, if I only have to focus on localization, like I just talk about localization, but Uh, I want to excel to a next level that I understand their overall business well. For example, if you are like a casual game,、uh, you want to local、uh, localize into Japan, then I have to understand their, for example, Japanese users,、um, their user pattern and their user profile, and also understand how. The customers are willing to, for example, in app purchase, or they're willing to watch ads. So how the companies can monetize themselves, and for example, how much they can monetize, how much they can invest, and what's the lifetime value of the individual users, and how much do you spend on like user acquisition and all the other things. And that's just for one round of games or one company. And I think. This is really curious to me because I want I want to learn about a lot of different things. I'm personally really curious person, and that can somewhat help me understand the customer's business well. And when I present to them my local edition strategy or the plan that I work、uh, work for them, but it can somewhat relate it to that. But sometimes it does not relate. So I won't say this is the compulsory. Element、uh, for a successful local edition consultant, but I think s- some time down the road that it will actually help、um, help the consultant to build the connection, rapport, and the trust with the customer. So I would say that's an opportunity for me to invest more time.、Uh, I would say this is a one thing, and another thing I think overall in the local edition industry. Um, maybe it's not just related to my role, but I think we can have more opportunities for people to share and to talk to each other and to understand each other's pain points. 
And uh, I think this, um, for example, we have really great open source documents or softwares from Silicon Valley. I see a lot of companies, they op- like publish their TMS systems. They have open source TMS system for other companies to use. I am also hopeful to see more trends coming up from other parts, not just from Silicon Valley. So people can uh, benefit from it, like from and also from each other's tools and open source documents or uh, there are white papers or they're on blocks. Yeah. So that was your, let's say, professional way how you can elevate your job, you know, to, to understand the business side. Yes. But maybe how about the <laughs> fundamental part? Are you a gamer? I am uh, actually. I'm uh, like a. Uh, I don't. I think I'm the the profile person who uh, just play casual games all the time. I I'm a casual game uh, addict. So I I am in app purchase person. So I purchased like spent <laughs> Chinese yuan to buy actual like a few candies or something. So. <laughs> Yeah, I do that. And I am um, addict to the cooking games. So like the burger flipping or like, so <laughs> I do that a lot of times and I'm pretty competitive with myself. So for example, if I cannot, I, so, <laughs> so I'm really addicted. It's a rabbit hole for me. So it's really dangerous when you just spend a lot of time. <laughs> do, do you think this is something that is beneficial to your role? I, I think it is gives me a perspective on, uh, for example, casual game. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I it's not realistic for me to be truly passionate about everything. Um, I am a shopper. I understand the user part of the journey. Also, um, I'd be lying to myself if I say like I'm a like big fan of all types of games, RPG games or different kinds of uh, games. But I have to have the curiosity to understand more, even though I'm not the target user. Uh, that I have to play them or to download the game to try it out or to understand the like business model of it. So yeah, even though I'm not the huge gamer uh, in the hardcore console game, but I still wanted to learn. And I still, I'm curious to learn more. I think that's okay that you're at least some gamer because I, I, I've, I've, I, I know about people who work in the game industry and they are not into games at all, like any kind of game. They just take it as a, as a job. And I think that maybe, especially if you're in the consultant role, maybe the people on the, the game development side, you're basically your customers. I think they would probably prefer to speak to someone who is into gaming because to, for them, I think it's a lot of passion that goes into making the game. So I think it's better if, I think you have a better chance at connecting with them if you actually understand their games, right? Yeah, I agree. Okay. So you said that <laughs> you're a very curious person. So let's talk about that. What are you curious about right now? I am curious about a lot of things. I I love books. So I am you don't see my bookshop now because I'm in a hotel, but I have a giant uh bookshop uh shop in, in my home. I usually read nonfiction books. Um, that's why I'm curious. Uh, I want to learn about a little bit of everything. So I read about physics, uh, about business, of course, and about uh, brain, like neuroscience, neurology. Um, so a lot of different things. So recently, I am, I'm doing a lot of things at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I'm multitasking in my spare time as well. Um, reading one book about VC, uh, I think the book title is called The Sand Hill Road. Uh, it talks about how, for example, as a startup, how you can raise money from VCs and as a VC, how you can survive because usually the, the venture capitalist firms, they um, rely on the big batch or the, the successful IPO companies and how they can monetize themselves, how they can uh, manage their, their own work system. So that's one book I was reading. And also I'm uh, learning CFA uh, so I want to self-learn at CFA, at least get to CFA level one. Uh, hopefully next time when I talk to you, I already have a certificate. So like a financial advisor? <laughs> yes, kind of like analyzing 
Uh, I also read the report, financial report of different companies. Um, for example, I know Airbnb and Bumble, they went uh, public recently. So I also read their, this is really good source of information for me to understand their business model, their competitive markets. Um, so I also read the financial report, of, of course, financial reports from Google and also other big companies. That's also one way for me to get uh, information about how companies work on their uh, on business model. And talking about the other non-business related topics is like I understand more about the brain because I think brain is one area that science has not like, on, we were still exploring, we're still on our way. We probably know 20% about how brain works. So we're still on the like locating which part of brain does what. Um, so that's really fascinating to me because I don't think um, we're that um, and that's there to other parts of our body because other part of our body, we pretty much know uh, a lot about it already. But brain, we're still relying on the MRI or fMRI technologies for us to understand more. And once we understand more, then we can develop other technologies to, um, to help to help us uh, on this field, like the neural link or other advanced technologies for, for, for people, let's see. <laughs> What I'm curious about is how do you focus your curiosity? Because you mentioned that you are curious about so many things. So do you read multiple books at the same time or do you pick one and then you finish it? I read multiple books at the same time. It's okay. In my mind, it's okay to, to do that. Um, I always think that everything will come back to me at one point. So even though... I'm learning physics. I'm lear learning um, business and neurology at the same time. The opinion or the points will come back to me uh, at one point, and I will be able to connect my dots uh, when I look back. So, yeah, I don't feel guilty about just reading multiple books at the same time. Uh, and I yeah, do Google searches a lot. Like if I have questions, I just like go into the rabbit hole of Google searches. <laughs> understand more. I was just thinking about it because when I interviewed Gaia, you know, I was asking her what is what is her superpower and she said it's connecting the dots. So I was just thinking about that, that it's good if you have knowledge from different disciplines, even though they may not be related directly, maybe sometime you will connect something that maybe other people wouldn't connect. So by the way, about that, what, what do you think is your superpower? I don't think I even asked you before during our intro call. <laughs> what, what do you think is your special, special thing that maybe others don't have? And what is the, the biggest asset that you bring to the, to the team and to your customers? Yeah, that's a good one. I think if I can say, I would say curiosity. <laughs> it's not the answer, uh, but I am really curious about a lot of different things. And also at the same time, Ed, I don't think I'm unique um, that I'm the only person that in this that I'm in the team having this uh, superpower. I also see from other leaders or other uh, successful business people, they're also curious in different things. For example, I was like, Deep job, they're really curious about other parts. So that's able for him. Like that's why he connected dots for different things. And also curiosity is the um, the first step to for you to make something new or to innovate. Um, I would say, yeah, that's my superpower to be curious about something and yeah, I'm willing to learn. And I think I have other superpowers that I'm passionate about things. I'm kind, I'm a kind person, and the other things. But I say the top one probably is curiosity. <laughs> so if you're if you're kind, what is the what is the last thing that pissed you off? Do you do you ever get mad at something or no? I get mad at the things. Um I think I'm pretty a professionalist in a way that I I can I can actually I can be Anybody can do a lot of things. I can be a writer. I can be, um, a, I don't know, software engineer. I can be a painter. Like I don't see myself only uh, being the localization industry and doing localization consulting all the time. So in another life, in a parallel universe, I can be a, a different person, different prof in a different profession. But I really want to be really good at it, uh, at whatever I do. I think I have this really high standard about myself. 
uh, that I, whatever I do, I want to to spend the most time and to be able to do it really well. So I might get disappointed. I won't say pissed off by seeing that, um, like, if you you are just live without purpose or without thinking, or without reflection, or just want to do jobs. Um, just for the sake of accomplishing it, and that's it. So I feel like maybe that's not really that's not what I'm uh, thinking about, what passionate about. So I think is I really want um, everybody. I hope it's also not so de- uh, condescending is to people to think more, to reflect more. And once you decided to do something, is the best that you are the best of it, or try to do it really well. Yeah, when you were talking about that, I, I I saw myself in that, and yeah, but I but I also think that there is a problem with that because sometimes when I do something just for the leisure, you know, like I don't know, sports or hobby or, or dancing, the problem for me is that I want to be better at that every time. But maybe there are things where we shouldn't like push ourselves; we should just enjoy and being being amateur. Or, you know, what what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I thank you for bringing this up. I'm not the person that I wanted myself to be great at, at everything and my uh, hobby as well. I remember when I was talking to one of my friends, because I also like uh, rock climbing, I like bouldering uh, as well. But a lot of things that you have to train, you have to invest your time to train. So I, I was talking also complaining with my friend that I can only get to a certain level. So I can only get to maybe like V3, the bouldering level. I cannot go above that because I think I don't have the physical strength or I'm not trained enough, well enough. And my friend was like, me, you're, this is just your hobby. You don't have to be great at this. Just relax. <laughs> I was like, wow, yes, yes, that's true. That's true. Like I, I don't have to be the top. Right. Everything. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a really good point. <laughs> so, okay. So what is something that people seem to misunderstand about you? And what I mean by that is they, they meet you, you seem like a funny girl, you know, likes to laugh, talk to people, but maybe that's not the truth. So now we know that it's the truth, but what is like the first impression that you think you give to people? And then once once they tell you about it, you're like, Actually, no, that's that's not me. I'm quite the opposite. Interesting. Oh, we're getting really philosophical here. Uh, <laughs> I think I am pretty much an open book. Uh, I, I what I consider it is I, I don't hide or I try not to be pretend to be somebody else. Uh, but I also think maybe because I'm still learning more about myself. Uh, I, I take personality tests like uh, different ones uh, and that's one way for me to understand more about myself uh, I would say that people might consider me as an ex, uh, extrovert but sometimes I also mm-hmm. think I, I just want to stay at home and uh, mm-hmm. I just read I don't like to party a lot uh, now at this age <laughs> I, I think maybe that's one thing is I also I'm trying to learn more about myself because from the personality test, um, the test actually shows me I'm an extrovert, but I, in, in my mind, I don't think I'm an extrovert. I might be a mix of extrovert and introvert. And there's a like, spectrum of it. So yeah, maybe that's the one thing. So, so did you do the Meyer Briggs test? The four letters, right? Yes, yes. That's the one. And also the other ones, like we have color insights and strength finder but i think that yeah that's the like mpt or something that's the the one that i was talking about do you remember what did you get i think i'm like labeled as a campaigner um i don't remember the exact letters but i'm extrovert and i like to i'm passionate about things so i like to campaign start different projects and that's it (laughs) have you ever heard about the human design system no, no. What is it? I'm curious. <laughs> like you, I was also into these personality tests. And then when I was doing an interview with Gilad, he used to work for Microsoft. He was a big guy on internationalization. He told me about the human design system. And the human design system is basically, it's basically based on when you were born. 
So you type it in and it does some analysis on something on, on you. But when I was reading it, the personality that I got, actually, it seemed to be quite, quite fitting. So that's another thing that you can, you can pick out. Wow. I'm so curious. Yeah. But you need some, maybe some specialists to give you more explanation on it because there's, it goes very deep. It's not like, like the Maya Briggs does. So. Okay. I'll check it out. Thanks for <laughs> sharing with me. We were talking before about, you know, the companies being agile and maybe the culture of failing. So I'm wondering how, how are you dealing personally with failures? As you talked about that um, you don't see a lot of challenges with something. It's not like a roadblock, you know, so in your personal life, do you, do you see failures in your life or is it just a lesson learned for you and you move on quickly from a, from a failure? Or you don't even call it a failure. It's just, I don't know, something happened and okay, let's let's move on. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think um, when you first mention about failure or something, mm -hmm. I think people might consider as failures. Um, like before I, um, before I joined Google, I actually applied for different companies. I also like did some interviews with companies uh, and some might, you know, work out at a certain time, maybe like before the offering stage or before maybe, maybe um, before like uh, the interview stage at uh, like uh, re resume selection stage. So some people, I would say my uh, learning that I can share with people who are currently looking for a new job is you might consider that this as a failure on yourself. Like this company, they don't want to hire me. I really love this company. I'm really passionate about what they do. And this job is a great fit for myself. Um, but in the end, it didn't work out. Um, this is, then I think is um, with time, I realized that it's not just on you. There are so many like dependencies or so many um, like reasons that you don't know because it's not such a transparent, not so transparent. Some companies are trying to give you more um, knowledge or information, but it's not an equal, like you're not in the equal stage as the company, hiring company or hiring manager. So don't blame this on yourself and just keep moving. There's also a suggestion offered to me uh, when I was applying for a job is don't get discouraged if you cannot join the company that you wanted um, right now. This also means that you have possibilities in the future or the right company, the right fit for you is waiting for you for your next move. So, so keep applying and keep learning, but at the same time, you have to reflect on yourself. That's the only thing you can change. And you cannot change for like other things like headcount or uh, the job scope or the good managers or not, the companies. Um, but you can change uh, on how you think about things and how you can, for example, better improve yourselves to 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 do the next job interviews. When you actually made it to the job interview, what can you say? What kind of answers you can give to to the um, like the questions asked? So I would say that I was rejected by a few companies in the past, and I I think when I look back from from it now is. Um, Maybe it doesn't work out for a reason, but for me, it's to keep going and to think about how I can be a better uh, person, better version of myself uh, in the future for the right opportunity. You talked about self-reflection a few times. How, how actually does your self-reflection look like? like? Do you have a process for that? Or if I came to you as a self-reflection consultant, <laughs> how, how would you advise me to, to best self-reflect or how, how do you do it yourself? Yeah, I think this is a great question, Andrea. I think that um, I, I'll say the reflection, self-reflection is one essential way for for me for my, to grow. Um, I actually don't have a standard strategy to do it. I have a notebook. I, I sometimes write things there. And sometimes I just write things on my phone. 
So whenever I talk to someone or I had an emotion where I learned something from a book or from a talk, I would try to, to think more or try to keep it in my mind. And also I share with people. So that actual, actually also reinforced my memory. Um, and then it became a reflection point that whenever, for example, I talk to one person, this person says something I really um, disagree or I disagree, but I don't want to, sh- um, like maybe I won't share with them later or not at the moment at the point. So I will keep a note in my mind. Uh, this is also similar to what I do after a day, after I finish, for example, my presentation with a client, after I finished my uh, presentation in, in conference, I also do a mini reflection on what work really well I'm working probably as something I need to improve the next so that's just for me for my own personal improvements to to do um, sometimes when I work with the client or with, with the client or with my colleagues um, I think it's also a way for, for example if you uh, want to help the other person to grow is also in a really safe environment to share your observation your reflection to the other person so to help each other to develop this muscle uh, mechanism, like to to think, to reflect on uh, what you have done or what kind of things you, you uh, like everyday things. So you can just make it better or try to uh, get closer to your goal. So I think that's um, yeah, that's how I usually do it. Not really systematic, <laughs> but I think it's really important for me uh, to have this moment. It's not to go running and accomplish all the tasks every day, but have a moment with myself. Maybe that's my introvert part of myself is to to be with myself and to think and to reflect on what went through, like what happened in today, in the day. When you take notes, does it mean you do something like a journaling? Do you do journaling? I don't. Uh, I don't journal about uh, my life, but I keep a s- small notebook or keep some notes about um, something, ins- what things that will inspire me, that inspires me. So, for example, I listen to the talks from uh, from leaders, from like female leaders. Um, then I will note down the suggestions that she offers to uh, female workers. So. Yeah, I think just don't let it go. This is really a precious point. The suggestion is from uh, top leaders. Uh, think about it and also think about it constantly. Um, so yeah, that's how I keep it in my small like notebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good advice. I think that a lot of people make the mistake that they try to rely on their head. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you cannot you cannot keep all the good ideas in your head. It's it's better to put it down. And even just putting it down on the paper, it helps you, I don't know, structure or think more about the idea. Just the same way when you mentioned sharing, when you share with other people, it's you, you can get feedback. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, so the notorious question, what do you think is wrong with our industry? Um, I think I also shared earlier is... I, I do hope to a more open communication uh, in this industry. I think Silicon Valley is doing pretty okay. Sometimes, for example, uh, there are multiple conferences or like free workshops. Uh, IMAC is a great platform and also women in localization and some like blocks. People, companies share their um, expertise, like their own experience with each other openly. Um, but I think overall is, uh, I, I do think localization industry is not moving fast enough like all other companies. And one of the reasons is probably because this is not the core competency of a company and they try not to um, like have create a platform to share with each other. So when we think about the cross, uh, the industry platforms like Lockwood or uh, I say, uh, yeah, those platforms, they're all like organized by a third party. Um, third party, maybe... Um, industry, a third party company or consulting company. Um, I think we we will encourage, we should have more innovation, more open sharing. And I also am hopeful to see more startups uh, coming up. So not dominated by the big players. 
so I see more VC funds coming into this industry because it's also really tech heavy. Uh, I see more. I hope to see more like startups or um, solution companies or smaller companies emerging. And yeah, hopefully, hopeful to see more opportunities by the new starters. Maybe this would be a confidential question, but would you see yourself creating the startup at some point? Or, or do you see yourself more of an employee person? Yeah, it's not so confidential because I can also, I think I'm really passionate about uh, new solutions, new technology, and I also really admire uh, the startup founders and uh, this, like maybe the early uh, time employees. Um, I, I don't, I think I can see myself uh, in a similar role. Um, but I, I, I think when I actually, when you see me, for example, starting my new company, it's really my passion and I want to be all in. I don't want to do it as a side gig. Um, I also started a few, like, I also, I, will, I consider myself an entrepreneur because I also started a company earlier on in my life in, in college. Um, so I think at this stage is uh, if I decided to to be uh, startup startup founder or join a startup is something that I want to invest all my en- energy uh, attention in. So yeah. Okay. So one day, <laughs> maybe <laughs> in industries disrupting the localization space. Yes. <laughs> so things you change your mind about. I'm not sure if you had a chance to think about this because a lot of the people are they don't know what to think about it but what i basically mean by this is that i don't know you were thinking the world behaves in a certain way and then something happened you read something you did your self reflection and then suddenly you're like oh it's actually not like that like i was wrong the whole time <laughs> like something like a radical mind shift has something like that happened to you that you can recall and share with us I actually can't think of anything at the moment, but I would say that I probably had a different understanding about some Chinese companies and how, uh, like going back to the localization topic is sometimes I'm surprised about how quick to action some of the Chinese companies are or some of the APEC companies are, even though that they are like really starting up and how uh, committed they are to work on localization. So that's maybe one story or one one thing I can share about this question is how willing they are to invest in their workflow improvement or their quality improvement. Sometimes really surprised, yeah. Mm Okay, so the second question, maybe hopefully this time <laughs> it will land. What are the absurd or stupid things that you do? Oh, there are so many stupid things I do. <laughs> we have some time, so we can start. Ah, uh, stupid uh, things. I. <laughs> because I also feel like stupid. A lot of things I consider them stupid. I, th- I think it's I think it's that, that that other people would consider it stupid or absurd, but for you it's quite normal. Oh, uh, so I assure that I really love books. So um, when I was living in in Beijing, um, Beijing is a big city, and when I was living here, I was living in the like suburb in Haidian district, which is really far away from the malls or from the city center. It's more like a university part of the city. So really far away from everything. And um, I really love books and I like one of the bookshops that's actually located in the city center. So I usually will, in, in, my, in my weekend Sunday ritual is I will take the uh, subway an hour one way. So at least two hours to commute to the books bookshop and then come back 
So that's my Sunday ritual. So that's something I, I, I do constantly, probably every weekend or maybe bi-weekly. And that's something I do try to do when I go into different cities. I will try I will to visit their um, bookstores and then try to explore what is going on. So I think the bookstore is one way for me to understand the vibe of that city and also defines whether I like that city or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay um we're at the end of our interview i think we're right on time so the final question is what would be your parting words if you could speak to the minds of everyone in the industry what would you tell them i encourage everybody to uh, learn and to engage with the APAC more I think I truly believe that APAC is a really promising market or promising uh, region, especially I think in Asia or in China, Greater China or Southeast Asia region. Um, so I encourage people um, to switch their mindset, if not already, to think more about what is going on, to understand more about what is going on in APAC and to talk to the people who are actually based in APAC. Also, I encourage you, anybody who's listening to this, to encourage, to, to, to contact me and to share your thoughts with me and also with the people here. Um, I think there's a lot going on that you probably, you're not aware um, yet, but there's a lot of interesting things. And I think more communication, more sharing and will help, uh, help the world become a better place and also maybe help your business or your company's vision to accomplish here as well. Well, thank you for your sharing and your contribution to the podcast. Thank you for this interview and thank you for your time. And hopefully we'll talk to each other some other time. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Andrea. You are doing a great job. I uh, appreciate everything you do. Uh, thank you so much for your time today as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.